This is Bonjour Hi, the Normie Jewison's edition. I'm Avi Fongold, and I'm here with CJN senior editor Phoebe Maltzbovi. We are your Frozen Chosen. On today's show, we speak with New York Times writer Mark Tracy about diasporism and the rise of Jews identifying as diasporist. What does the label mean? What does it say about the times we live in and our evolving relationship to Zionism? Make sure to stick around to the end for Anachos of the Week. All that and more coming up. Phoebe, how's it going? All right. How are you doing, Avi? Doing all right. Are you uh, are you an Oscars watcher? Do you like wait for the nominations with bated breath? Um, so the most I've been following the Oscars this year is a Hillary Clinton tweet wherein she compares herself with the snubbed Greta Gerwig and Margot Robbie, and that is the angle of Oscars following, which is not really not really the correct one. I think I, I still end up in the politics culture wars zone which is i know i know not not the fun way but avi have you been following the oscars not even a little bit i have friends that have oscars parties and they all dress up and it's so not for me i'm not an oscars person uh there were snubs from what i understand bradley cooper's nose um got a very jewish thing but i think to me the big jewish news or the big canadian wait wait, what happened with brad bradley cooper and the oscars i I, I don't know was it a snub nose sorry I, I (laughs) i like that (laughs) But the Canadian Jewish uh, or Canadian or Jewish news of uh, of film this week is the passing of Norman Jewison. Uh, Mm -hmm. Were you aware of the existence of Norman Jewison? I was aware of the existence of Norman Jewison, if never as distinctly as this week. Were you aware that he actually wasn't Jewish? I learned this week both that he wasn't Jewish and that there had been a question of this. I had never really thought about it, but I guess it makes sense if somebody's name was Jewison and more to the point. A director of great cinema classics, including, of course, Fiddler on the Roof. Um, yes. the, the most Jewish film of all time, or arguably, potentially, the most Jewish film of all time. A, a great Canadian uh, directing a great film um, about great Jewish stories, but uh, that's about as Jewish as it gets. He was not Jewish himself. Do you think he benefited in that very specific context, like to get that role? Do you think? Meaning, do you think that do they think, gave him the job? He, yeah. And then do you he think walks they were in like, and he's like, Jewish? I'm not Jewish. And then they like were the, stuck. Yeah. I mean, the, the Fiddler on the Roof, though, did come up recently, though. Uh, and the reason I've been thinking about it was in a Daniel Bergner New York Times Magazine article called Black and Jewish Activists Have Allied for Decades, What Now? About uh, sort of alliances and rifts in activism in the U.S. particularly. Mm -hmm. Uh, But the reason I mentioned Fiddler on the Roof in this context, you might think, what does this have to do with Fiddler on the Roof, is that one of the people who Bergner profiles, uh, a young woman named Ava Borgwart, tells him that she rewatched Fiddler on the Roof as an adult and that while doing so, and this is a quote, all I could think about was the Nakba. And then Bergner explains she uses the Arabic word meaning catastrophe, which is the way Palestinians refer to having fled or been driven from their homes during the founding of Israel. And then I'm going to continue from a quote from her uh, in the play. She said, this Jewish family is being expelled by pogroms from their homes. And I was sobbing, sobbing for the Nakba. Bergner ends the article, um, her tears seemed to be not simply for the Nakba, she seemed, in a sense, to be crying over the Jewish nation. She seemed ready to renounce it, end quote. But um, it's interesting, right, this idea of do you take from Fiddler on the Roof a distinctly Jewish message? Do you take a the opposite or well, what, what I, does it all mean <laughs> right now all i can think about is thinking about like may god bless and keep hamas far away from us <laughs> well i guess that's not how everybody <laughs> that's not how everybody <laughs> would interpret this but to your question actually to me and i read this article and the howler from this article and i can't remember if it's the same woman or somebody else within the article is quoted as being really, really sad every time she goes to a Seder and they don't mention black slavery in America. It was a different woman in the article who is a woman who is not Jewish. I do think, though, that this was quite something. The idea that you are um, being too much about Jews if you make Passover about Jews. 
you know, I've mentioned in the past, I think my dad is a Mason and you have to, uh, there's things you have to do in order to be initiated and to be partaking in certain rites. And in order to do those things, you have to actually be part of this group. And the mm-hmm. Seder um, is a particularistic thing, right? You mm-hmm. don't get certain things as a Jew um, if you're not a Jew. Um, the Seder is not about everything for everybody. You can make some parallels to it. You can talk about it. But um, at, th- at the end of the day, there's nothing wrong with being particularistic and to say that these things are for certain um, individuals. And, you know, I'm sorry, but not everything is about everybody. Yes, this is something. And I think that this is like, yes, I I think there is such a thing as being too particularistic, insular, or self-centered in the sense of your actual personal self or of your own group. That exists, that exists. But so too, I think, does this sort of anti-particularistic thing and yeah, I, I did not understand this. And I genuinely, what I would like you to address when you're looking into this further is why people continue inviting this lady to their satyrs. I, I will if try she and finds it too Jewish. <laughs> because honestly, like, yeah. I would just say, okay, you think the satyr is too Jewish? Then don't come. Like, do something else with your time. Can I ask, can I ask you something? Sure. Um, I don't know if you remember, but... There was a 2015 revival of Fiddler on the Roof on Broadway that I actually saw, and it was a little bit a similar sort of conversation around it, because in the ending scene, Tevya and the family are leaving, and Tefka are wearing, like, life jackets that were common to see in, like, Syrian refugees. So it was this big revival of Fiddler, and at the end, commenting about the current refugee crisis from other places this is interesting i also saw it on broadway when it was revived i don't remember either the life jackets or the discourse why were people upset at the time or were they that it was decentering the jewish story and and being like there's a refugee crisis now i Um, see so it was departicularizing. I see. I mean, I, I wouldn't. I would say that as a departicularizing, if it literally was just life jackets at the end, making a reference to contemporary relevance, but still having it all be the rest of it be fiddler on the roof, it's pretty particular. Like it's yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Speaking of the high barrier for entry and what we need to do to become Jewish, there was a piece in Times of Israel that really struck me. The headline was, Government Failure to Arrange Circumcisions Delays Conversion to Judaism for 98 Men. Uh, So there are at least 98 men in Israel who completed their conversion to Judaism have been waiting since April for a government-funded circumcision that would finalize the process, officials said, citing bureaucratic complications and funding issues. I was not aware that the government pays for your circumcision in Israel, and it was like, To add to that, the idea that, like, well, sometimes bureaucratic delays will prevent a circumcision from happening. I thought that that was quite interesting. And uh, some private donors have stepped in. I didn't realize that the Israeli army has their own conversion program. And then the other piece that was interesting in there is that uh, most converts are women. Uh, It it goes as high as 80% of the total on a general uh, year-by-year basis. That's the part that I was not shocked about because of probably for a lot of people, circumcision is a high barrier for entry. Yeah, I mean, I think in terms of the conversion issue, circumcision, certainly, but also matrilineal descent, isn't it? Like, if you're a Jewish woman and you marry a non-Jewish man, you can have Jewish children without any anyone Yeah, converting. so I do... I also think in the U.S., a lot of men just are circumcised, so that's... Um, <laughs> Yeah, no. so 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 I think that it's a little bit of everything. Is that if a Jewish woman marries a non-Jewish man, um, even if he doesn't want to convert, the children will still be Jewish. And for some people, that 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 is enough. Um, I'm not making any value statements. I'm just making you can observations ha- I know what your here. values are, Avi. But the point is, what I'm asking <laughs> is though. No, but I was also going to say just you don't know my values it. about this. But anyways, no, I, and the, the, you could suspect. The, I but, could uh, suspect. But what I was going to say though, more to the point, is. Are, is it not possible in certain denominations of Judaism for a man to convert into Judaism and leave his penis be? Um, I have looked into this in the past. We've had discussions with uh, intactivists. Uh, we had an episode about that a long <laughs> while back, uh, and no pun intended. And uh, uh, in the research that I did, it is very, very difficult. It's considered pretty mm. much a mm. universally accepted still 
like big part so of the even Jewish like community. reconstructionist whatever you would still uh, have yeah to... so i think it's one of those situations where they wouldn't necessarily uh convert you without it um whereas if you happen to be born jewish and you chose not to be circumcised they may still accept you as a member of the faith i see both uh traditional and liberal do grapple with these questions and these are very deep questions that many people well, discuss i'm, I'm glad to have daughters and to have not had to think about any of this is, is the is as far as i can go with this because it seems like it's a lot a lot to think about for yes um, but enough about that. The New York Times recently published a piece by Mark Tracy about Jews embracing an idea called diasporism. This movement, which sees Jews looking to decentralize Zionism and Israel from their Jewish identity, isn't actually so new, but seems to be having a bit of a moment. We talked to Mark this week about his reporting and what it all means. Stay tuned for that right after word from our sponsor. Are you in the market for a new watch or a special piece of jewelry? Are you looking for the perfect engagement ring to pop the question? Atelier Lou has all this and more. Eric and the team at Atelier Lou can craft a piece for you, or you can select from some of the exclusive designers that they offer. From a simple bangle to a statement necklace, Atelier Lou can make you or your loved ones sparkle. Located in the heart of Westmount in Montreal or online at atelierlou.com, visit Atelier Lou for your next watch or jewelry purchase. And when you do, make sure to use promo code BON18 for 10% off your next purchase. That's atelierlou.com. We're really happy today to speak with Mark Tracy, who's a New York Times arts and culture reporter. He previously worked at Tablet and co-edited a 2012 book of essays called Jewish Jocks. The reason we're talking with him today, though, is about uh, his coverage in the Times of the American Jewish community uh, since October 7th, and specifically a new article from January 14th called Is Israel Part of What It Means to Be Jewish? And it's about something called diasporism. So welcome, Mark, and please do tell us what is diasporism? Well, thank you very much um, for having me. You know, diasporism doesn't mean necessarily uh, being a diaspora Jew, meaning a Jew who does not live in in the national homeland, which, uh, you know, for the last 75 years has been a state of Israel in the in the historic homeland of the Jewish people. But diasporism, you know, many many diaspora Jews, rather, would not consider themselves diasporous because what it means to be diasporous is not just to live outside of Israel. It's to kind of embrace the fact that you do not live in Israel, uh, that Israel, um, certainly the modern political state, and maybe even the place that we, of course, do all pray to if we are praying Jewishly, you know, is not at the center of your, of your Judaism. And, and that is kind of a more radical break with Jewish past, even though, of course, you know, having a Jewish state in the land of Israel um, is itself a radical break with, you know, much of Jewish history. You know, you know, there's been some continuous population of Jews in, in that land, but most of Jewish history for the last 2,000 years has taken place outside of that land. And are there any diasporists in Israel itself? Definitely. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there, there was a wonderful quote, which is in my article, which is actually, I'm, I'm paraphrasing now, but it's basically, to be a Jew is to be an exile. Uh, and uh, that would be true even if you were in Jerusalem. Um, in other words, it's, it's, it's as much a state of mind. There are definitely, there are several Hasidic sects that um, are not Zionist because they believe that Jews should only kind of return to and redeem the land once, you know, the Messiah has come and then God will mm-hmm. kind of make that happen. Mm-hmm. Um but there are members of, of some of those sects who live in Israel, which, among other things, is the country in the world with the most Jews. And, and frankly, no one knows this for certain, but, you know, if demographic trend lines continue, Israel will have the majority of the world's Jews. And you can definitely be a diasporist and still engage with the country of Israel, perhaps live in the country of Israel. Um, you know, several several of the diasporists I spoke to spoke of the, the Jews of Israel as essentially another diaspora community, uh, or could mm-hmm. be another diaspora community, which Jews would very much have an interest in. Diasporic Jews would very much have an interest in. Um, mm-hmm. There's yeah, nothing I mean, about so interesting. in diasporism yeah. that's about not about having solidarity with Jews. Now, critics of diasporism would mm-hmm. say, well, you are in a lack of solidarity with the Jews of Israel because you aren't necessarily defending the state enough. Um, m- although I don't think it's quite like a indispensable tenet of diasporism. Diasporists tend to be more in favor of a, you know, some 
some version of a single state in the land for for Jews and Palestinians, for Israeli Jews and Palestinians, Mm -hmm. which many Zionists say is, you know, worse than just maybe not supporting Israel. Um, Yeah. I mean, so you talk about the secular and religious uh, diasporist um, ways of being, and they do seem to be very different things, like the, the way there's the religious idea of the land of Israel versus, the, you know, the modern nation state of Israel and all of that. But something I was wondering about um, was just the the October 7th angle and the sort yes. of things changing angle and just how big of an increase there's been in diasporism. But also, I guess what I was trying to make sense of, and I'm still trying to wrap my head around, is how much that's offset by increases in the other directions. So you mentioned sort of greater mm-hmm. numbers, getting a newsletter, um, that would be more of a diasporist, of a more of a diasporist bent. But then I would assume that there's also a lot of people signing up for sort of pro-Zionist type outlet or whatever or newsletter. So how do you make sense of if this is just an increase of right. in, an interest in the topic among Jews, especially, and how much is um, that Jews are moving in that direction? It's definitely both, right? Um, you know, I'm sure I can find statistics. We see it in polling. Um, and also just anecdotally, if you are at all engaged with the Jewish community, wherever you are, uh, Brooklyn, Toronto, Chicago, uh, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, um, you know, there's a lot of people for whom October 7th uh, was a moment of increased feeling Jewishness. Several people I spoke to, including people skeptical of Zionism, said this to me. So, of course, that's been happening. I think what October 7th was and the aftermath, you know, the Israel's response and the number of, of deaths – has been a very polarizing moment in the American Jewish community. And it is true that if you were to take a poll of the world's Jews, uh, you would find that more people swung in the kind of, seems silly to say pro-Israel in this context, but we'll just, we all know what Mm -hmm. I'm saying, pro-Israel direction, you'd find that more in Israel where support for the the war in Gaza continues to be sky high. I I think it's just done both. Um, It's polarized in both directions, like like everything else in life now, and especially like everything else in American life now. So at, at moments such as that, you know, people look for the ideas that are on offer. And so for many people, you know, the idea on offer is Israel as the last best hope for Jewish security, or even just, even if you don't feel that way, you might just feel total Jewish solidarity. You know, I mean, I wasn't going to get into this in like a New York Times article, but there's, there's Am Yisrael. Uh, which is kind of the people of Israel. There's um, Eretz Israel, which is the kind of land of Israel, but not in any modern political sense. And then there's Medina Israel, which is like the state of Israel. It's, it's kind of, you know... I'm glad I took that year of, that sorry, year of Hebrew in college. Um. It's, it's, it's kind of funny. And, and, you know, Israel wasn't always going to be called Israel. Like, that wasn't inevitable. And it's frankly, you know, confusing to people who don't understand this, that, like, the land of Israel is not actually a reference exactly to the country of Israel. And a diasporist would say one can perhaps pray to the land of Israel and even hold a certain place in one's heart for the land of Israel while not holding the same place in one's heart for the country of Israel, even if Zionists would have a different response to that. This is is so interesting, yeah, because it really gets it that it's not just a religious versus secular divide. It's something much more complicated. Zach, what have you got to say on this? I feel like diasporaism, or certainly the people you described in the article, are defining themselves sort of in the negative, in opposition to something, Mm -hmm. they're calling it Zionism. But I'm curious if you can elaborate on, like, what they think Zionism is. What And there are many Zionisms, right? I mean, there are many many Zionisms, Zionisms, yeah. So I'm curious what these people are defining themselves in opposition to. It varies. I'd say the biggest common denominator would be just, like, in the Jewish mainstream around the world— Israel is revered. It is is placed on something of a pedestal. Again, that's not a criticism. And it's, it's not, I don't mean that in a, in, a, in a biased way. It's just it's just a fact. And a lot of Zionist ideology, particularly early Zionist ideology, but in a way that, that very much bled into contemporary Zionist ideology, says that, like, being in Israel, right, being emigrating to Israel as a Jew is, like, a higher form of being a Jew. Like, to make emigration to Israel, we say, and we being Jews everywhere, call it making Aliyah, which is, of course, a reference to, it means rising, uh, ascending. It mean, it's the word we use for receiving a blessing or saying the blessing, you know, being being honored before a reading of the Torah. For a diasporist, for someone who feels that living outside of Israel, living marginally as a Jew, living 
as a minority in a place where the majority is something else, um, you know, that's actually as valid and frankly maybe even a more valid way to them of being a Jew. So, you know, we're bringing up a lot of these um, complications and I'm curious about the, uh, the fact that we're in some way still um, putting buckets, putting people into certain buckets, right? You're either a Zionist or you're a diasporist, when the reality of it is a lot messier, right? There's a lot of people um, who would say, I may have some serious critiques with Israel, but that still makes me a Zionist. I may live in America, um, but that doesn't make me as a diasporist necessarily. So many um, secular Americans who claim strong Zionist ties and, you know, donate to APAC and really, you know, for them, the experience of Israel is a couple weeks at a time at a high fancy, you know, at a fancy resort and a high floor in Jerusalem. Yes. And does that make them really Zionist, or are they kind of more diasporous? They kind of say, I would never make Aliyah. I'm, ma- I'm living in, in America because that's where I want to live. Um, right. They would never call themselves diasporists. Conversely, plenty of the people that are being lumped into the diasporist you know, bucket tend to still have a deep relationship with Israel, right? Um, you were talking about the Hasidic sects that see this as like a, you know, unfair, adva- like pushing of the Messianic era. They still have a deep, deep, deep relationship with Israel yes. to the point that they want to live there, right? Yeah. But they just are not necessarily nationalist, right? There's, there are secular people that have deep uh, problems with, um, you know, a nationalist Jewish state, but they would have an equal problem. The Bundists and the Neo-Bundists that you, would, that you speak about in the article— would have just as deep a problem with Palestinian nationalism as they have with Israel, with like Jewish nationalism. Yeah. yeah, it's very interesting. And you couldn't be more right. I mean, these things are complicated. They cross lots of lines. Um, and again, it's also hard to disentangle the difference between what you kind of wish were the case and the fact that there are seven plus million Jews living in mm-hmm. the, land of, the land of Israel now, in a country that is the Jewish national homeland. You know, there was an interesting moment a few a few weeks ago. Lots of critics of Israel discovered. I, I'm putting discovered somewhat in condescending quotes that the Hasidic Satmar sect, who uh, I'm looking at my window because it's a half mile north of me in South Williamsburg, and you know I hear their siren every Friday night. You know, are anti-Zionist, right? And so they were kind of being enlisted um, by critics of Israel, saying, "Look, like you can be Jewish and be anti-Zionist. Look at the." Satmar Hasidim. And the Satmar response was like, look, like, we do have this theological thing, you're right, but like lots of this criticism of Israel is expressing an undue lack of solidarity with other Jews. We feel solidarity with other Jews, including Israeli Jews, and we don't want to be lumped in with your uh, cause. Yeah, and I think that what's you know, the, the part that I have such difficulty with in society and a little bit like with the people that are in the piece, and I'm curious if you yeah. can reflect on this, like in the speaking, I mean, I've met Shaul Magid a couple of times. He's a great guy. Yeah. And I think that what he means by diasporism is kind of different from what a lot of other people do. Um, sure. But there's no, there's no real category of non-Zionist and not by, by non-Zionist being not anti-Zionist, of a-Zionism, right. right? Or just, I have a complicated relationship with Israel. Great Zionism, um, sorry. You know, and yeah, yeah s- something. And, you know, I find that because there's, a, there's actually more of those people, and there's because there's people. no category that basically says, I'm not really the Zionism that, that is in this mainstream definition of what people are talking about, right. then I guess that kind of makes me anti-Zionist. They don't want that, but they're feeling pushed into the other category because they're like, well, I'm so, not this, and you're pushing me into that. Avi, I just have to interrupt because we, when we had a little discussion about this beforehand, we were discussing whether some of this is Canada versus U.S. and whether the U.S. does have a bigger space for, for lack of a better term, liberal Zionism or what you talk about, not that these are the same thing, but moderate diasporism or something like that. Because th- all of this sounds very much like my own politics, and I do not feel like I'm that unusual coming from New York, having such politics, whereas it seems like in Canada – the Jews I know are either or tend to be more um, kind of one thing or the other. Um, in your researching, did you find a lot of these, like what I would call a Zionists, right, as opposed to anti Zionists, the people that were really who don't sort make of it in the middle? personality, right? Yeah, they're like, listen, I don't care. I it's, it's not a thing for me. I mean, a lot of them are in Israel, where they call themselves post Zionists, right? Like they're Israelis, and like it's their country. Why why should they have to leave? 
Uh, but yeah, and, and, and I know lots of American Jews who don't want to talk about Israel really. And like to some extent, that kind of is by default a little bit maybe diasporous. Like they're saying Israel needs not to be at the center of my Judaism, which like Israel is at the center of American Judaism, like in many ways. That's not that's not a particularly controversial thing to say. You know, as someone brought up in, in an American Jewish household and in the American Jewish institutions. It's a major, major aspect of being Jewish in America. Certainly it has been. Um, so to say I just want to, you know, do Havdalah and celebrate the holidays and maybe even send my kids to Jewish day school, but, like, I don't want Israel to be anything, you know, that is kind of... If you look at how Zionism has basically replaced um, Judy, Jewish culture in a lot of places, right? Mm-hmm. There, there's a lot of people that... Ju- the only thing that they do until it came to before it was fight anti-Semitism. Before that, it was support Israel, right? It's all about support Israel, support Israel, support Israel. And that became religion for a lot of people. Or did it become and religion? It, Avi, I, I hate to interrupt. But, for, well, do I hate please. to interrupt? Um, <laughs> I love to interrupt. Um, so please uh, enjoy. Um, but what uh, I was going to say... cultural inheritance. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I, I call it being like authentic. Um, but I do think some of it is just about normalizing Jewish identity in the diaspora and about making it so the way if you're Irish Catholic, you might feel some kind of affinity to Ireland. You know what I mean? It's like it gives a kind of concrete thing that other people can understand about why Jews would be a people and not just a religion. And to say, well, we're it's it's almost like it it retroactively makes Jews this population of an immigrant population from Israel, even though even though in the actual you know, I don't think that chronology. That makes you a- no, no, but I'm saying that I don't think it necessarily is that it's functioning like a religion that it's Zionism functioning like a religion. I think it's Zionism functioning as, I think it's Israel functioning as a kind of unifying thing. And I was thinking about this also in terms of Avi, what to sort of yes and something you were saying earlier when you were talking about the people whose Zionism manifests itself as going to some like fancy hotel in Jerusalem. I was thinking about birthright and how people always criticize it on the basis of how it's, you know, oh, they're going to do Zionist indoctrination, whatever. I did not find that on my trip. It was about, and I've also since reading, um, that Michael Steinhardt um, autobiography or whatever, it really did drive home what I found on my 2007 or whatever it was birthright trip, that this is about diaspora Jews. This is about making diaspora Jews marry one another, make the Jewish babies in the diaspora. There's no pretense that a group of Jews taking a flight from New York to Tel Aviv are, are, you know, are going to um, stay there. It's like yeah. you're quoting an, a paragraph in my draft that fell out. <laughs> birthright might be the ultimate example of this, right? Like, and you're completely right. And in conception, birthright was not about mm-hmm. encouraging Aliyah. Birthright is about uh-huh. and it, mm-hmm. Jewish connection. But, but I guess what I'm trying to get at is that, like, just because you have centered Jewish religion or culture or history um, to, uh, over the fact of, like, Israel as a state um, doesn't necessarily make you a diasporist. Right. And the same way that you, you know, like I said, it, sure. it just makes you something right. there. It's, and I think that, the, right. I, I was saying that a lot of these, like the way I was saying, these secular Americans probably are more diasporous because they would never in a million years, even though they talk about Ali all the time, would never personally make Ali themselves. They would never count themselves as diasporists themselves when in right. reality, the people that are being put into this bucket, they're like happy to live in Israel. They just may have some problems with whatever's going on. Well, and, and, and I, I think, think that when, there's something there that we really have to like, I, I would love to, you know. But also not all, not yeah. all diaspora Jews uh, to, to say perhaps the obvious, most sure. diaspora Jews are not uh, diaspora under any rubric, right? Mm-hmm. Like they are sure. Americans. They're not going to move to Israel. It's not their country. But like Israel's going to still be a big part of being Jewish to them. And I think that's the real difference yeah. is like for dias- sure. a diasporist feels like it isn't for them and shouldn't be. Mm-hmm. So Jews. something about this that I was wondering about is just this um, question of diasporism as an end to – as sort of the end to Israel as a – modern Jewish nation state potentially and being open to that, at least whether it's that you're actively calling for that to end or you're just sort of okay with it, like see what comes. But is diasporism connected to some kind of broader anti-nation state idea, open borders and ending all boundaries? We are going to be all one humanity in a beautiful, you know what I mean? Like, I guess, because, and I think about this specifically though, in terms of Palestinians who yeah. Their national self-determination is also important. I mean, I think it's important, but it's also important to many of the people you're talking about. 
You know, yeah, it is. It so is. how do they reconcile the idea that people should be diasporic? I mean, you, I mean, you talk I, about this in the article, yeah. but... It, it can sound like saying no Jewish state, but yes, a Palestinian state. Now, they wouldn't say that. For some of them, their diasporism very much arises out of, like, anti-nationalism generally. Um, for some of them, it's an understanding of being Jewish, that, like, you know, Judaism as we practice it today was born out of exile, Um, Now, there was Judaism before exile, of course, like very famously. You read about it in all our holy books. um, But that's not really the Judaism that we all practice today, just, you know, where we go to synagogue. And, you know, lots of Jews will not, even religious Jews, will not set foot on the Temple Mount, where which used to be the center of Jewish ritual and and practice. Mm -hmm. I mean, the Um, Jewish specificity, though, I just wanted to ask about that, like this idea of the of diasporism as kind of an anachronism. And this is the part that has always struck me. And there's a quote in your article from a Stanford professor, um, Stephen J. Zipperstein, to posit the credibility of an early 20th century ideology that had some impact on interwar Europe until Much of East and Central Europe was obliterated by forces diasporism could never have predicted while ignoring the reality of millions and millions of people is an exercise in putting one's head in the sand. So I read this quote and I thought, okay, he said it perhaps more bluntly, but also better than I could have. And I've had similar thoughts as well and can kind of understand this, this idea that like, yes, you can have whatever views you want about um, what should have happened in history, but we are in a time that is not the 19th century or the early 20th century and things not just, it's not just the Holocaust happened, but like the state of Israel happened. There are all these people there. Like, what does it mean to sort of have this kind of like Jews are a diasporic people. It's we're we're not rooted. Yes. And it just like something about it just seems like a little bit, I don't even know what my question is here because it's just something no, that just strikes me. It, it is the biggest stumbling block for many people, I think. And, and I, like, yeah, justly so. my my question is like, do the do the people you encounter have this sort of Pollyannish or you know a little bit of a rose colored view of what um, diaspora life was like at at one time? Oh, interesting. I don't think that's the case. Um, you know, they know what happened to the Bund. <laughs> And for those who don't know, the Bund was liquidated by the Nazis, right? Like, I mean, you know, they all were killed. Um, they know what happened to the Bund. I, I, I thought you were going to say, do they have a Pollyannish, rose-colored view of what would happen if Israel went away to the 7 million-plus Jews who live there? And again, I, I don't want to characterize them as being rose-colored or Pollyannish, but I think they think it would all go okay. And I think there are many people who disagree with that, and I don't think those people are crazy, certainly. Uh, I mean, we don't, no one knows, no one could know. But to your question, I think they do understand. I mean, which is Steve's point, obviously. And Steve, who knows whereof he speaks, uh, he wrote a biography of Ahad Ha'am, whose real name was Asher Ginsburg, who was an early kind of cultural Zionist, wasn't opposed to the political state of Israel necessarily, and and, um, also has written a book about the Kishinev pogrom, which prompted many people, including uh, my own family, to get out of Dodge and, in our case, come to America. Um, so I, I do think they know. I, I just think they think – and I don't think this is entirely unjust that, like, there are now, as there weren't in the 1930s or 1910s or 1890s, uh, places in the world that are not Israel where Jews could feel kind of permanently secure. Now, is that true? Well, no one could say for sure. And also no one could say for sure – if that were true in a world without Israel, right? Like, and to your Canada America point, I, I do wonder, and that's not something I explored enough, uh, to be honest. Uh, I do wonder if, you know, your status in um, the dominant culture changes that. So, like in France, which has one of the Jew- largest Jewish populations in the world, um, Jews there have been emigrating to Israel at, at higher numbers because there have been a number of, pu- of you know, very highly publicized anti-Semitic incidents. Um, and they may very reasonably feel that they don't have a feeling of security there, as American Jews might feel that they do. It's also, um, just to interrupt, it's also that they're a different Jewish population, more um, from North Africa. They have, Sephardic, there are a lot of different, yes, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Sorry, that's, um, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, no, no. There's a Something. play on Broadway right now, which I've seen, called yeah. Prepare for the French Republic, which is entirely about that. But I have of course, part it, yes. of, it felt, it feels, and again, I haven't spoken to the playwright, so I, I can't say this for certain, but like, it feels, it felt watching it to me a little like, he wanted to write a play about contemporary anti-Semitism, which is a re- reasonable thing to want to do. But you, 
you know, sending that in America, not that there aren't anti-Semitic incidents in America. We know there are. There have been murders, in fact. You know, it, it wouldn't ring quite as true is not the right word because obviously – there is anti-Semitism in America, but like it would be, it would make it makes much more sense in a French context, um, perhaps than in an American one, where like, you know, you're in, you're sitting in Broadway watching on a Broadway theater watching this play, which is about Jews, and like, you know, God knows what percentage of the audience is Jewish. You know, it's not, it's not, it's not none. You know, I saw a Yiddish fiddler on the roof in New York. You know, several years ago. You know, that's the kind of market there is in, for this stuff in, yeah. in New York City. So, but if you are in Buenos Aires, which has one of the highest Jewish populations in the world, how might you feel if you're in Toronto, if you're in Paris? Um, to say nothing of, you know, if you're in, I mean, I don't even know. I was going to say like Morocco, but like most Moroccan Jews are now in Israel. Yeah, I'm still grappling with this. And, and I, I find it fascinating. And I think that there is, there's a lot to it. Um, and... I'm curious about this, the thing that you're bringing up here in terms of the, uh, the security aspect and, mm. you know, what happens when, you know, you talked about, you know, that the diasporas must feel, right, must embrace the marginality, right, that in their minds. And I think that, I th- uh, you know, I think that the Zionist is the one that feels more marginal. Uh, often mm. than the diaspora. Mm. It's the one that says, you know, the reason why we need to have Israel is because I feel so marginal in America, or I feel like I'm not secure, right? And therefore, um, I, I need to have a place where I can, you know, bug out. That's my, it's my uh, safe room, right? So yeah. to speak, it's my panic There's- room. Um, if, if things I, I go wrong, I can always go to Israel. And that, that seems to be, in your mind, uh, at least a hallmark of diasporic thinking, diasporist thinking. And, and I'm like, that's kind of very Zionist too. Mm-hmm. There's a podcast episode I'd recommend to anyone less as like it's brilliant and more as like a, a perfect document of what you're saying. Um, in the weeks after October 7th, uh, the author Yossi Klein Halevi, who's mm-hmm. American born Israeli um, center, center right author, um, you know, when I say center right, you know, he's definitely a very strong Zionist, yeah. also was like at the sure. forefront against, you know, the judiciary overhaul last year. Um, he went on the Ezra Klein show. I, you know, I'm at the Times. That's obviously a Times podcast. And, like, it's, it was fascinating to listen to him because he was just like, if the Israeli army fails, then there's no hope for the Jewish people. And on the one hand, you want to say, well, is that true? Like, I, you know, I... If you, you put know, all your I cards guess. in one hand, then, then 100%. I mean, that is right. Funny. That is what Daniel modern Zionism is. Yeah. Modest, the Daniel Boyar in the Talmudist, who was one of the people I interviewed, said there's a whole there's a there's a part of the Talmud, there's a line in the Talmud that's like, why did uh, why did God divide the Jews between the Roman Empire and the Sasanian Empire, which mm-hmm. is the Persian Empire? And it was like because that way, if the Roman Empire Jews all get killed, there's the Sasanian Jews, and if the Sasanian Jews all get killed, there's the Roman Jews, which is not a lovely way to think necessarily, but like it's kind of a coldly practical one, I would say. Um, so yeah, you're definitely right that a lot of Zionists feel that way, and what a diasporist I think would say is. They do feel that way, yes, but, like, should they? Or is that, like, a, I don't know, take your pick, a, a trauma response or a, a brain... I mean, I, I certainly think there's a lot of Jewish trauma on all sides, yeah. and, and I think it manifests in a lot of different ways. Um, so. Yeah, so to the diasporist way of responding to it, at least the way that I've always seen diasporists uh, function, is that in their minds, it's, I don't need to embrace the marginality. I need to, it's more along the lines of, I need to recognize what the forces are around me yeah. that made mm-hmm. me marginal. And if I mm-hmm. work it to fix, and I'm I, not necessarily, you know, believing in intersectionality, whatever it is, but, but the, if, I, if I work to fix the lot of Jews here yeah. and all people here, then as you say, the, all of it gets better, right? If you, can fix, that, if you can fix the Sasanian Jews, then the, then the Jerusalem Jews are going to fi- get, get, that, get repaired as well. There's that thing yeah. where like maybe 15, 20 years ago, the Malaysian prime, I think it was Malaysia prime minister, got in trouble for saying something you know, and he meant it anti-Semitically, to be sure. I'm not defending him. But basically the line was the Jews invented human rights to make persecuting them wrong. And, you know, again, he meant it anti-Semitically. Historically, that's not entirely an inaccurate description of the development of human rights ideology over the last well, hundred years. You know, to apply that a lot to of the thinkers were Jews who were, you know, genocide, famously co- a term coined by Raphael Lemkin uh, in the wake of the Holocaust. You know, like um, yes, my. I mean, it's not really like in the flow of our conversation, but something that I've been thinking fine. about also <laughs> with this, and mm-hmm. I have participated in this as well, um, which is the anti-Zionist, non-Zionist, perhaps 
with some overlap, diasporist Jews seem to me to be very much overrepresented in media mm. coverage relative to numbers. My theory is that this is because of who works at, you know, like a publication, who's in academia. These are worlds I know. Podcast listeners. Well, sorry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yes. Not yes. all guests. Yeah. Get, not right. all guests are you know mindful enough of that. <laughs> um, but basically, that this is a group of people who are also younger, although not necessarily the bulk of young Jews. I think there are a lot of I don't know whether the word is normies or however you want to put it of like people who do not um, have these views, but you but they're very visible also at protests. You know, like a lot of very visual things, you know what I mean? So I guess the reason I think this is relevant, and I think that the the stakes of this, like, on the one hand, I think it's very important to cover this and to show that Jews are not, um, to use the word I think Zach used before when we were talking about the monolith, you know, to, that there is that there is this um, ideological diversity, and that, you know, not all Jews certainly support Netanyahu personally, or his politics, or whatever. But also, I feel like this can lead to sometimes this danger of when people say, oh, I don't hate Jews, I just hate those Zionists, forgetting mm -hmm. that that is like virtually Russians. the same. Yeah, Russians. I mean, it's also it's also many non-Jews or, you know, like sure. numerically, presumably most Zionists would be non-Jews. But like the idea is that um, I guess I just worry sometimes with like there's been so, so much coverage of this and I have contributed mm -hmm. to the coverage. Um, I have read it. I have shared it. I have produce my own. Nevertheless, there is something that concerns me about this. And I wonder if you have any thoughts about that. Well, first, let me just say, I think normie, both in terms of the Jewish community and politics generally, is one of the most descriptively useful terms there is. These are the people who decide our elections. They're the vast majority of people. They don't follow politics closely. They don't listen to, you know, mm. podcasts about Jewish life and culture. Really? Uh, oh. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, maybe they do. I hope they do. Yeah, but, no, you know, I, I know what you mean. They're, yeah. they're likely to be a little less engaged. Um, and that's fine. That's not an insult. <laughs> they're, you know, normie means normal, right? Like normative. Um, so I think you're right that this viewpoint is overrepresented in media. And I suspect you're right about why or part of why, um, you know, in, in American politics, our version of this is, you know, uh, you know, the, in the in the like 2020 primary, like it seemed like no one was supporting Biden um, because in media, you know, why would you like the 70 whatever year old, you know, centrist guy who's been in politics for 50 years? It turned out, you know, normie Democrats uh, did. Uh, they they handed him the nomination quite rapidly, frankly, um, uh, after after brief setbacks in the first two states. Um, so I, I think you're totally right. And the, def the defense I would give of you, me, and everyone else in media who does highlight these minority viewpoints, and we do label them minority viewpoints. I know my mm -hmm. article. Yes, you did a really good job. You did a really good viewpoint. job on that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, well, you know, there is a bias in journalism in covering things towards the novel, towards, towards what's, you know, a Zionist Jew is – is a little more dog bites man. Now that is its own problem, which we need to reckon with in in the media, right? Like if you if you are just searching for the man bites dog stories, then you're not kind of accurately representing reality. And what you want to do is kind of like highlight the man bites dog stories while you know not advocating for for what's in them and not uh, giving the false impression that. They are, in fact, dog bites man stories. It's tricky, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's not otherwise totally you, a solve. I think you did a good job of that, giving the context, right? I think of, of showing that this was not, this isn't mm -hmm. how Jews are not. Because I right. think My sometimes, goal wasn't yeah. to persuade people. It was yes. to highlight this thing. And yes. again, when I say highlight, it's because, well, many, many, many readers, Jewish and not, might not be aware because they might primarily be familiar with diaspora Jews who are Zionists, who are supporters of Israel. And because that describes most diaspora Jews. Uh, I'm concerned um, on the other side of it um, of how much the normies right get assumed to be uh, completely in the other direction by the, mm. you know, by the establishment Jewish community, for example, right? The assumption is if you're not a diasporist or if you're not an anti-Zionist, you're automatically, right, a, like a staunch Zionist. And they're taking um, and for granted. The, uh, and that's absolutely, for yeah. Whereas, like, I know sure. a, lot, a lot of people, I'm not going to name names in my life, but you can probably figure it out, but like, uh, who last year during the judicial overhaul stuff 
were like, what what are they doing? Like it is, and again, I think it's because it reminded them of Trump Trump type stuff. Um, yeah. But you know, they they can read translations of what Ben Gvir or Smotrich say, um, or Netanyahu for that matter, um, and that's not stuff that accords with the kind of normy diaspora Jew worldview, right? Um, it's very not that. Yeah. And can I just follow up on on Phoebe's question, like to maybe to put it more bluntly? Um, do you think this is this like a thing outside of like hip progressives in Brooklyn, like or or Toronto or Toronto? Like, yes, there are these small. How how yeah. minor is? Do you think this? How widespread? Do you think this is? I'm just curious if you think there, this there's is. No way, there's yeah. no way to know for sure. What I'd say is this. Um, I'd say two related things. One is the one reason maybe to cover things that are predominantly believed by these kind of cultural vanguards, um, small cultural vanguards. I mean, that's a redundancy, right? A vanguard is small. Um, it's just that they are, you know, if you know our French, as Canadians presumably do, you know, vanguard <laughs> means, you know, you're kind of uh, ahead of things. Um, and, uh, you know, if you're ahead of things, then other people are going to follow. And I guess that could happen in two ways. One is... They do <laughs> – I was about to say they do control the media. Uh, but, uh, you know, they do have d- outsized impact in, um, in the media, which is how people get their information. And so that's going to have some kind of influence. And second of all, you know, again, in moments of crisis, um, which this is for the Jewish community, in crisis, you know, as, as we know, just means things can dramatically move in one direction or the other, right? Like people are going to look around for the ideas that are there. They're not going to come up with super brand new ideas. There's going to be a, there's going to be a crisis, and there's going to be ideas lying around, and those ideas are then going to get picked up. And this is an idea lying around that I think more Jews might be open to now than have been uh, in certainly the past. You know, if you're talking twenty, thirty years ago, when everything seemed hunky dory with comparatively hunky dory with Israel, um, or even. Um, you know, the recent past when there wasn't a the most right wing government in Israeli history slash there wasn't October 7th, which provoked Jewish solidarity, but also raised questions about Jewish safety in Israel. I mean, this is, you know, people have said it's the deadliest day since for Jews since the Holocaust, which it was. It's also the deadliest day for Jews since the founding of Israel. And it happened in Israel to say nothing of the response, which I think, again, even normie American Jews feel that, you know, whatever the number is, however many thousands dead, um, not all of them Hamas militants or terrorists by any means, um, you know, ha- has been, I mean, again, I'm not going to name names, but like person close to me in my life who one would consider a normie American Jew, you know, we were talking months ago and they were like, you know, I mean, I know it's, it's been too many deaths, it, too, too many people, have, meaning Palestinians. It's obviously too many. And it was just like – and she was saying in the course of defending Israel um, or partly defending Israel, which is fine. Uh, but I think, I think it's understood that like it broadly believed that like this is another level. This has been another level of response from Israel and I think that's really rattled people. Yeah, yeah. I think this is important to talk about and also just to remember that like even though there is always this idea of everybody being in sort of one team or another, I think – just having a sort of, I don't even know if normie here is the word, or just like a common sense sort of, like, how would you not be upset by October 7th? How would you not be upset by the number of deaths that have followed? Like, it just seems like the, I almost wonder if what gets overrepresented is the viewpoint that that only one side has anything going for it as versus like, it's terrible when people are killed. It's terrible. Alan Wolf, who's Mm -hmm. a kind of elder statesman of quote, diasporism, um, he, this wasn't in the piece, but he said, you know, October 7th made me in many ways feel more Jewish. Like, how could it not? And so if you're a Jew, even one mixed feelings about Israel, mixed feelings about Zionism, like, how can you, how could you not feel Mark, will you stick around and uh, give us some nachas? Yes, it's a party trick that I've been doing. So I have a uh, three-year-old and a one-year-old, uh, two, two boys, um, and taking the older one to various Tat Shabbats, I have learned uh, the song There's a Dinosaur Knocking at My Door. For of those course. who don't know, the of dinosaur course. wants to have Shabbat. Um, but I did not grow up with that song. I grew up at a Jewish preschool, and I remember our songs. This was not among them, and I did a tiny bit of Googling, and it's because the song came about 
only a few years, but a few years after I, w- I was in preschool. I only learned about it on, you know, with my son. So, but now what I do is I'll meet the child of another friend of mine. Um, not always Jewish, by the way, but I'll learn that they go to a Jewish day school, which I, or a Jewish preschool, which again, especially in Brooklyn, very common to, even if you're not Jewish, the JCC's there, it's nice, it's good, send them there. And I'll do a little party trick with the kids where I'll learn where they go and I was like, and I'll be like, do you know a song about a dinosaur? And they'll smile because, of course, they sing it. And that that's my nachas. Nothing, you, nothing could possibly bring me more than that. Will you sing it for it? No, I'm kidding. You don't have to, yeah. um, I've heard it more than enough times yes. having had somebody who led Tachabat for many, many years in my house and uh, having tots and all that. But that's a, I like that. Phoebe, what's your nachas this week? I'm going to do a very, very topical one, which is the 1980s, although technically it started in the 70s, television show The Facts of Life streaming on Pluto TV, so anybody can just oh, watch okay. it. You take the good, um, you take the bad, you take the rest. The, it has uh, Mindy Kahn as yes. Natalie Green. I knew this. It's like one of these things, you know, but and as a sort of rerun aficionado, I feel like I had just kind of forgotten about her as one of the great jewish women of sitcom jewish characters played by a jewish actress in a way that is sort of distinctly jewish and yeah natalie is just like she's she's this type of person you don't often see represented among in a show with teenage girls like she's sort of sarcastic snarky or something but like also very good natured and um that is what made me feel good about being jewish this i remember when watching the facts of life uh that i would get nachas from knowing that there was a jewish character and a jewish uh, actor on 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 the show Uh, and i was a kid but that mm-hmm. was the, I distinctly remember that as part of it. So what have you got this week? Anything more, more recent than the 1980s? Or? <laughs> uh, yeah, apparently uh, there is a world record that is trying to be broken. Congregation Rodef Shalom on the Upper West Side um, baked a 35-foot-long challah. Um, apparently there is a global challah uh, length contest uh, that Guinness actually uh, tracks. Uh, I'm trying so <laughs> hard not to make any kind of circumcision jokes best (laughs) thing since sliced bread sorry yeah exactly um and there are several articles that are talking about uh the logistics involved in braiding and baking a 35 foot long challah i like that it had to be made in borough park but then uh trucked along with in an 18 wheeler to new jersey to find the like a kosher bakery that had a uh oven that was long enough to be able um to bake said challah i Cannot wait to see what will get beyond this. Is there a 53-foot challah coming along someday? Possibly. Um, but for now, it is kind of nice. It was made for this Shabbat of love with uh, the Jewish Federations of North America. Um, maybe they got confused. Tu Bishvat is today. Tu Ba'av is a, week, uh, is a day of a, a, a love holiday, but that's in the summer. Um, maybe that's what happened. Maybe not. Um, I think my kids would love a 35-foot-long challah because they don't like the crust, and so everybody would be able to get an inside piece. Excellent. Although, wow. to be fair, <laughs> what I'm imagining is all the leftovers, like everybody ate a slice right from the end, and there's like a foot and a half of challah, and then 33 and a half feet of French toast. Yeah, yeah. I was picturing just like one of those giant hero sandwiches, though, that it would be sliced the other way. Mark, this has been uh, most enlightening. Uh, come back anytime. Uh, oh, thank and- you, Endorse. <laughs> thank you. Couldn't, uh, be more, couldn't be a, there's no way I'd rather spend an hour, seriously, than <laughs> awesome. talking about this stuff. Well, thank you so much. Energy. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Bonjour Chai for the week ending January 27th, Shabbat Parashat B'Shalach, Shabbat Shira. The show is produced and edited by Zach Kaufman. The executive producer for CJN Podcast is Michael Freeman. Our music is by So Called. We are a project of the Jewish Living Lab and are distributed by the CJN Podcast Network. You can listen to all our past episodes on our page at the cjn.ca slash bonjour, and you can subscribe to the podcast and automatically receive all episodes on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love it if you told a friend about Bonjour Chai. It is one of the best ways we get new listeners. As always, please email us with comments at bonjour at the cjn.ca. There's a dinosaur knocking at my door, and he's come to say Shabbat Shalom to me. Right? <laughs> and wow. then you add this, there's multiple, there's, a, there's pieces on it and whatever. Yeah. <laughs>